going to go ahead and get started. I think it's 11.30 now. I'm just referring to my phone it is. Um, my name is Maria Anderson. I'm going to be talking about the future of e-learning. Um, I'm going to just put up my contact information for just a sec. It's on my card, so um, it shouldn't be any big surprise. Uh, I teach at a community college in Michigan, U.S., and uh, one of my roles there is as um, the learning futurist for um, the, what we call the LIFT Institute at my college. And LIFT stands for Learning, Innovation, Futuring, and Technology. So one of the things that I do is I, I look at problems um, and look to what could be possible solutions for those problems. Uh, I'm, I'm not a futurist who likes to um, look at projections of kind of a, a gloomy future without being able to propose some vision for what might uh, be a good solution to the, the future we might be facing. Um, and so this talk uh, is a little different than the one I gave last year. If, uh, if you're at my talk last year, I shared a lot of um, evidence for why I think um, we're moving in the direction we're moving in education and a lot of examples of, of different companies that are doing innovative things. And um, that talk is currently up on my website and a link. Um, so you can uh, actually go watch that one too if you feel like you needed a precursor more to this one. Um, but this, this particular talk, I'm talking about a couple of visions I, I see, possible visions for the future. These aren't um, all of the possible visions for the future, but these are the ones that I, I, will, I see based on the evidence um, from psychology and learning theories that might be good possibilities for the future. And I think it's really important that we have futurists who provide, um, you know, we have the, the theme for this conference, from vision to action, right? Well, if there's not a good vision, then we're not going to have good action. And I think it's really important sometimes to have a good common vision where everybody can kind of get behind that vision and say, okay, well, there's multiple possibilities that could happen, but I like this vision, and I want to put my efforts into going there. Um, so while there's a lot of really depressing things happening in education right now, I want to um, try to provide you with a positive vision of where we could go with the technologies we have and the, and the world we have today. Um, yeah, I just finished a, a PhD in higher education leadership. The week I graduated, I think about 12 different states cut their higher education budgets by something like 10 to 40 percent. It was kind of a depressing, uh, it, very, very bittersweet to both be um, studying that field and watching it get decimated by funding. And somebody told me the other day, and I can't remember who it was, so if you're in here, I'll give you credit, but I don't know who you are anymore, um, that, the, that the U.S. will do anything it can to improve education, except pay for it. And I think that's probably true. So anyways, I'm going to look more today at some visions for um, the future of uh, e-learning in particular. And um, e-learning uh, is a is uh, kind of an emerging hot topic in education, but in other fields as well, besides education, um, e-learning, uh, the definition is a distributed education through some kind of digital means. Um, I'm not just going to talk about education today. Um, I want to talk about kind of three um, different uh, fields here, um, education, the corporate environment, and what I call free-range learning. Um, the learning that happens outside of education and work, basically. I should have called it education and work in hindsight, but it says corporate on here, so I'm going to stick with that. Um, so we're going to start with this kind of educational uh, environment. And it, it, you can make some arguments about where some of these things fall. And sometimes my illustrator puts things places where I might say it doesn't fall here. But uh, libraries and museums, you could say, fall either in education or in kind of free-range learning, really. So I'll, I'll just put that criticism of it out there to start with. Um, I'm going to look first, I'm going I'm to tell you some of the problems I see that we're facing and then look at some of the visions that might, um, might bring us to better resolution of these problems. And so the first problem I want to talk about in e-learning, and I'm just curious, how many of you in this room, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and actually raise it, otherwise I'm going to make you stand up in the next poll. Those of you who know me know that what will happen. Um, how many of you teach or participate in any kind of online learning in a formal environment? Oh, right, that's like about half, maybe even more half than half of the room. So I see that this problem in online learning. I, I have both taken online classes and I teach online classes. I'm teaching online classes right now. If you're on Twitter, you can say hi to my online classes. They're under there too. Um, and so I see this problem in e-learning, e um, which is that it's a pretty lonely environment. 
It's pretty lonely for the students, and it's pretty lonely for the teachers. There's this space that separates them, and all of the communication in these environments is very scripted. So, you know, a lot of online teachers say things like, oh, well, I have discussion boards. And, you know, they communicate with each other via discussion boards, but discussion board is completely prescribed communication. It's here's what you have, you know, the students say, what do I have to do in this to actually, you know, pass the class? And that's what they do. And very rarely do they go beyond that. And, and so this prescribed communication is not the way that we learn in kind of a, a salon environment or, you know, when you go to the coffee shop and have a conversation with somebody, it, it's a, a much more natural type of communication. And if you even just think about the kinds of interactions that happen in a live classroom, a tr very traditional learning environment, um, there's those conversations that happen before class. There's that, you know, you nudge your, the person sitting next to you and ask them a question. All of those kinds of natural communications that just are not in um, the, the platforms we have for e-learning. So one of the problems I see is that the, the digital learning experience, as it is currently structured, it doesn't reproduce the kinds of natural social communication that we really need to have for learning. It's a very solitary experience. Now, does that mean that students don't learn from e-learning classes? No. But could we have something better? Yes, I think we could. Um, and really what we want to have is a, a, a more natural environment with natural communication. And I, I think what's really missing when you kind of go all, you drill down to what the problem is with not having that natural communication is that your ideas don't get challenged in real time. When we have a conversation together in the hallway or at lunch or, or in a classroom, your ideas are being challenged in real time and you have to think on your feet and you have to um, have your ideas gel, and that just doesn't happen in online environments because uh, most of the communication is done as asynchronous. And in the synchronous environment, um, even that it tends to be fairly prescribed. You know, I'm the teacher and I will have an office hour. You can ask questions, but not really a challenge of your knowledge in that environment. So that's a problem, I think, and that's a problem we should fix because if the projections hold out as they are projected, that was very eloquent, um, E-learning is going to keep getting bigger. More students every year are going to be using e-learning. Uh, K-12 is going to be using it like gangbusters. As the price of gas goes up, we're going to be using it more. Uh, natural disasters have shown that you know when when a school has to be closed because of some kind of tragedy, um, you know they can sh quickly shift into the online environment. So we need to solve this problem so that 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 learning is actually very top notch. Okay, another problem I think we have is that and this one's going to be probably the most challenged of all these that I'm talking about, um, that we live in an audiovisual world today, and text is no longer an effective means of learning transfer. I'm not saying it's not efficient, and I'm not saying it's not good at information transfer. Text is extremely efficient for information transfer. The question is, with the students who grew up in the environment we have today, and the adults who live in the environment we have today, is text an effective means of learning transfer? And those of you who are teachers in the room, I'm sure you have a lot to say about this, but we have this problem in education that students don't read. They don't read anything that you put, that you give them. They don't read the text. Even the publishers will acknowledge that this is this huge problem. The textbooks that students are buying do not get read. They get read in little snippets. They get read when there's like when they're in an online platform and they click on read and there's two paragraphs that are relevant to them. But they don't get read in the same way that I see a lot of people nodding. They don't get read in the same way that they used to. I'm not saying that text will go away. And there's there's talk this afternoon actually that William Cross comes in here somewhere. He's he's doing it. And I went to one of his talks four years ago and he really challenged my thinking by saying that he thought, you know, by talking about the end of the, the written word. Now I don't think we're gonna see that. But I do think that we are losing the written word as a means of, of learning transfer. And I'll talk about that a little bit more here. What, what professors often uh, ask me about is they say, um, you know, I learned with, by reading. The students today should learn by reading. You know, it's really important. It's, it's the best means of transfer. But if you think on an evolutionary scare, scale, for tens of thousands of years, there was not text. We, we evolved with this idea of oral communication and visual communication. We had conversations with each other, we mentored each other, we learned from the elder of the tribe. It was all visual and, and audio, right? And you know, as we continue on, even when text was invented, and it is just a technology text, 
even when text was invented, um, it was only the very rich or the religiously elite that had access to it at first. The, the common man still didn't have it, right? Um, and, uh, you know, then there was this brief blip in our evolutionary history where text suddenly became the best way to transfer information um, from one to many. And it became cheap all of a sudden. And that's been like the last century, right? Where it became cheap and affordable and you could buy books and have easy access to books and articles and look at the internet today, right? I mean, so text is now kind of ubiquitously available. But that doesn't mean it's the best thing for us to learn from. Because evolutionarily speaking, we have a much, uh, a much greater inclination towards visual and oral. If you don't believe me, then watch kids and, and even watch your fellow adults. If you have to learn how to fix, like, your dishwasher, what would you rather do? Pull up a manual and read it? Or watch a video on YouTube where somebody shows you how to fix it? YouTube. 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 Yeah, absolutely. We now have the ability in today's world to um, have video go one to many, right? The reason we didn't go right from oral and visual to one to many video is because we just didn't have the technology yet. And we do now. So it's no surprise that, that our students are gravitating towards it, our learners are gravitating towards it, whatever the age. And, um, and so we, uh, so I want you to remember here, as we talk about this, that text is simply a technology. Okay? And it's useful for efficiency. And there's, I, I don't think it's going away because I think we really need it for things like scanning of, of information to find the specific thing we want to learn about so that we can find a video or an audio to listen to or watch. Uh, so, it's, so it's a technology that's going to stick around, and I think um, Kevin Kelly makes a good point about this. Um, that um, I'm not quite there, I'm ahead of myself. Um, I think I talked about this already. Online video is now replacing the one-to-many function of, of the technology of text. But um, this problem is, is not going to eliminate text because uh, old technologies don't die. Kevin Kelly has a book about um, techno what technology wants, which is a great book. And he talks about this, old technologies don't die. They, get, they, they find a use, they find a niche, right? And text will be useful for things like scanning information, searching information, um, because it's great for computers, right, to search the information. And, um, and for environments where you can't listen or, or watch something. I mean, look at texting, for example. Something that didn't exist, you know, 10 years ago, is that right? I'm trying to get my timeline right here. Um, and now is so so well used in our society. That's not going to go away because you can't easily have a conversation. You couldn't all ha be having three hundred conversations with, you know, people outside this room while you're sitting here quietly, out loud, right? You'd have to do it by text. And so the, the technology won't die. Anyways, I'm getting kind of into this too much, but I think we'll see emerging of um, of technologies where, like, for example, um, when you watch some some video or you listen to some audiobook, you will get access to the text as well. Because the text will just be the background to the audio or visual that you already use. Okay, another problem I see, we're not quite to the solutions yet, but another problem I see is, is um, that uh, schools and educational institutions all tend to kind of have locked doors. And they, the content, for the most part, hides behind those locked doors. There are some exceptions to this, and I talked about that last year. Um, with the open courseware and open um, education movements and things like that. But for the most part, in e-learning, when your course is done, you lose all access to the content of that course and the context it was in. If you wrote in discussion boards inside that e-learning platform, you don't have access to those discussions anymore after the course ends because you can't get into the course anymore after the course ends. So the portability of the work you did inside the course does not leave the course unless you have the foresight to copy and paste it all outside the course. Um, so, so that access is really a problem because when you need to relearn something or, or think about an old idea, you need to be able to access the work you've already done. You need to be able to go back and look in your notes or go back and, and re-watch a video or something like that. And, and you know, in my own personal um, experience, my calculus students, it drives them nuts that they can't get back in. You know, when they take Calc 2, at another college, and they can't easily access the stuff that I had up for them in their Calc 1 class because they're no longer enrolled at my college and didn't go with them. Right? Even the, the textbook uh, model here is that students will be renting their books. They'll be renting their ebooks, 
which means they won't have access to that content after they're done with the rental period, right? Now, that's not different than what's happening now, because right now they just sell all the books back. Um, but, but shouldn't we want them to have that? I mean, should they have access to that material afterwards? I mean, isn't that a, an admirable uh, a goal to have, that you know, if you learned out of, out of something, that you, you still get to use it afterwards? So I think this is a, this is a problem. So uh, the vision I have for, for um, this particular, these particular issues of e-learning and education, and certainly there are more issues on this, but this is only a 45-minute talk, is that the learner should carry the platform with them. It shouldn't be the institution that provides the platform. It should be the student that provides the platform. The content should go, I, I think I talked in the description about this idea of a separation between content and assessment and coaching. Right? What the school can do is provide content in an organized form for the institution or the nonprofit organization or whoever is doing that can provide content in an organized form. The instructors can add in coaching on their side right? and, and, and in some kind of a, a accreditation of the material. But the learner should carry their, their uh, learning platform with them. And just think for a second about how email works. I'm guessing in this room there are people who use Gmail, people who use Yahoo, people who use Outlook, probably at least 10 different kinds of email systems being used in this room. But if I send an email to all of you, you can receive and read that email. Right? So in a perfect world, the, the college would have their, their um, content, or the organization would have their content structured in a way that any, you could all be on 10 different learning platforms. The one that suits you best, the one that suits your attention best, the one that suits your connectivity best, the one that organizes the information in a way you want to see it. For example, um, you might want to see videos first all the time. You might want to read text first all the time. Well, why can't a platform be customized to you so that you do always see the videos first and you do always see the text first? There's no reason why that content can't be organized that way. So I think that one thing we can do is to start to, to say, wait a second, it's the learner that's important here, and the system should be customized for the learner. If I take a course at a community college, the content comes into my system. If I go transfer to a four-year school, the content comes into my system. If over the summer I take a course from an online institution, the content comes into my system, and my system doesn't have to change every time I change institutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're talking about like one institution uses Blackboard, another uses Oh yeah, Power let's get rid of all of this. Let's right. just have a standard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's let's good, just but have a, a there's standard still the problem that the, when the course closes, you don't have access to it. Oh, but see, I, I think that that could change if the student's the one porting around the platform. I think if, the, if, you, if you kind of think of this model pouring in content, okay. right? Mm -hmm. If the content gets poured into your platform, then there's no reason why the links to the videos that are on the internet or mm -hmm. now, a lot of the stuff we're starting to link to in education mm -hmm. is openly available information, mm -hmm. but the organization of that stuff disappears when the course mm -hmm. shuts, right? But if all that stuff ports into your platform and you take the platform with you, then you take all that stuff with you too. You take your discussion board posts and you take, you know, the writing you did in an in-class wiki and all of that comes Great. with you. It's like you keeping your textbooks and all of your notes in paper. Yes. But now electronically. But now electronically. And we have this idea of an e, like an e portfolio, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But I think we have to take it one step further and say, you know, it's the student who technically is the customer of education, not the institution. The idea that we design all our learning platforms around the institution instead of the student is really kind of ludicrous if you start thinking about the email model. I mean just think if none of us could communicate with each other unless we had the same email platform. That would be ridiculous. Email wouldn't be what it is today, right? So I think we need a portable, um, a portable platform. I'm just calling it iLearn for now because of the all the i other i other stuff. So um, it's probably already taken, and you know somebody's probably just looked for the website. But I'm sure it's gone. Um, so uh, so the customer is um, the learner, not the institution. Okay. I think that um, these platforms can easily be built so that they can be video and audio centric with back-end text. Right now, every platform in existence for, um, for e-learning and education is basically text-centric. Because what are they modeling? Textbook, right? So if, if we consider text just a blip on the evolutionary scale, then we should be modeling a video audio-centric system with text support in the background, but not as the foreground. Um, but with that said, I said we could customize the system, right? So if you are a learner who needs to have text in the foreground, then you just decide what you want in the foreground. It's a simple kind of choice. 
Um, I think we also need to design platforms with social being very central to the system. And there are some new developments since last year here. Um, there's a company called Instructure Canvas, um, which is uh, supposedly, I haven't actually used it myself, but built uh, an e-learning platform with social as a major component of it, where you can plug in all of your social networks into it. Anyone in here using that? No? Okay, so anyways, you can look it up. Um, but we should try to replicate uh, the this, this social environment in our online systems, especially if we design with the learner in mind. And so we should try, there's this idea of the, the third place that somebody mentioned the other day, um, you know, that salon or coffee shop or a discussion group you go to, that comfortable environment where you can learn, that we should find a way to replicate that within these systems. It should be central to the learner. Um, you should be able to see, for example, when I'm, when I'm in an online system and learning, I should be able to see who else is in there with me. I should be able to see what they're working on. I should be able to chat with them if that's what I want to use. I should be able to audio talk with them by audio if that's what I want to use. I should be able to talk with them by video if that's what I want to use. And Google Plus, actually, which came out last, last week or the week before, has this thing called Hangouts, right, where you can like, go and hang out and see who else shows up to hang out. Right? That, that's getting towards the right idea here. Okay, so that needs to be built in as an integral piece. And again, if you think about this platform traveling with the student, they set it up for the way they want it. I might say, for example, I'm on a bad internet connection at home. I might say, well, I don't ever want to be available for video chat. I only want to do audio chat because I know it'll work well on my system. So it'll show me who's available and whether they have the capability for audio chat. It might only show me the people who are available by audio or text. You know? um, but that can all be customized to the learner instead of the institution. Okay, so I'm going to briefly touch on some corporate issues. This is not my area of expertise, but I did do a little bit of thinking about it and talked to some experts in the field about it uh, and some, and some bigger companies. I think one of the things, which is both a problem and a vision for the future, is that we're seeing the merging of e-learning, e-working, and e-living to the point where there's almost going to be no separation between them, which is both a problem because it feels like you're working all the time <laughs> or learning all the time, it, it, but it's also kind of a vision when you think about, you know, how can we best structure things to, uh, to, lit, to, to keep this in mind. And again, the, the, I think a portable learning system it, it works well for this because that portable learning system could eventually become your portable working environment and there could be a merging of all these things. Um, I think one of the huge problems we have, and I don't know why I listed this in corporate because it's for everything, but it just there's space in my diagram, so it's there. We have some major connectivity issues in, in the U.S. Um, I, hopefully you're better off in Canada than the U.S., but in the U.S., 30% of people don't have internet access. I mean, inter broadband internet access. Of course, they have dial-up internet access because the um, government requires the phone companies to bring you service. But as far as broadband connection, 30% of the people in the U.S. don't have it. Now, internet speeds increase all the time. But if you're at zero and the speed of internet doubles, you're still at zero. Right? So this is a major issue. Um, and so some of us are still communicating like this, and unfortunately a lot of the design is done by people who are in um, Silicon Valley, and they're functioning off internet speeds you know, that are like lightning fast. And so the technology that's being developed is being developed for lightning fast internet, and uh, the problem is this. On one end it's super fast, on the other end it's super slow. And we E-learning is really only as good as the connectivity it was designed for. If I design my e-learning for high-speed internet and you're using low-speed internet, well, you're using the same system as somebody with high-speed internet. Again, this is why I think we have to have a system where students um, each carry the platform with them. Because I could customize my platform to stream video at a, a lower frame per second rate if I have bad internet, right? Or customize it to stream at a high rate if I have good internet. But if the system would adapt to the user, that would be a much better environment for us. So that brings us back to here. Um, there's another thing in here. I, I listed some of the things I think that you could customize such an environment for. And once I started to think about this as a paradigm for the future, I, I think it just it really just clicked into place. And now it just bothers me really much that we designed for the institution. Um, but you could customize for connectivity if you're the individual learner. So I could say how fast I want to receive things, how I want to Know, which kinds of active, um, real-time things I want to participate in. You could have the ideal social environment for yourself. So for some students, they aren't distracted too much by all this clutter of tweets and Facebook and stuff like that. They might want that as part of their, their learning environment. 
Other people absolutely can't have it. They can't learn with it on. Right? So you customize your own environment for that um, to, to solve this like attention and distraction issues. Um, language. Think about it. If, if everybody customized their own environment and all of the content was formatted in a way that it just kind of filled in the right fields, there's no reason why some of that stuff couldn't go through a language translation as it drops into your platform. So if you're an English as a second language student and you're trying to um, learn in a class uh, that's online, there's no reason why some of that content could get translated and dropped in for you. It's not going to be a perfect translation, but translation is getting better and better all the time. Right? Um, and the same thing with the back-end text. If all of our videos have back-end text to support it, then that back-end text can also be translated, right? And so then my course that I develop in English could be taught in multiple languages all over the world, dropping into the platforms as it goes. Um, and then I think learning style could also be taken into account. We talked about that, deciding what, how you get your stuff delivered first. Um, another problem in the corporate environment is one I'm just going to talk briefly about is this increasing expense of in-person experience-based training. You know, as it becomes more expensive to fly, some of you experience that flying here, I'm sure. Um, it, it's not as easy anymore to bring all of your participants somewhere and train them and send them back home. And so there's this idea that we're going to get um, to this kind of vision of, of immersive um, environments, virtual environments. Um, but I think it's really important to, to, to note here, I think we are going here. I don't think there's any doubt that we're going here. But there's a couple of issues with this vision of, um, of learning. One is that the interface is bad right now. The idea that you could inter interface with a, a, a virtual world through a keyboard and a mouse. Yeah, Second Life didn't really take off, did it? Yeah. Um, and, and in the 90s, there was a guy named Josh Harris who basically built YouTube in the 90s. And, you know, he had the right idea, but the, techno the time and, and the technology was not ready for it. And if, if you're interested in that, it's a, if, you, if you do any kind of future in technology, and it, you should really watch this documentary called We Live in Public, which is about Josh Harris and his attempt to create a YouTube-like platform in the 90s. Um, so I think there's a cautionary note here that this will happen, but only when we hit kind of the triple here, the, the right technology in the right place at the right time. And so you can't, uh, you can't just say, you know, this is going to happen next year. It, it has to be a, a, a merging of all three of those. And we've hit two out of three in a couple places, I think, but not three out of three yet. We're getting closer, though, so this will start to happen for, for companies. Um, another problem, and I think the corporate environment, is actually this need to educate the customer or the client. You're more likely to have somebody buy your product or use you as a, as a, um, as a company if the, the customer or client understands you, understands what you do, they're more likely to pay more for it if they think value what it is you do, right? So I think that um, as far as that, we're going to start to see kind of just-in-time delivery of e-learning for the consumer and the client. And I think one of the ways that I, the, one of the best examples, I put up a QR code here, not because I think this is a being widespread used right now, but I, I saw a great example of this that I wanted to share with you because I think this is the, exactly the kind of way we would leverage this. Um, if you go to um, the, the DVD section of the store, probably many of you don't anymore because you just get it direct or whatever, but if you go to the DVD section of the store, um, you can see on the backs of some of the movies a QR code. And what does that QR code send you to? Not the website. Keep, keep trying. If you were the movie company and you wanted somebody to buy that DVD, what would you send them to? The trailer. The trailer. Right? So you educate the consumer at the point where they're thinking about buying your product, right? Um, so I mean, even just, just think about like two different brands of aspirin or something. You put a QR code on your brand that sends you to a video explaining why it's better to buy a brand name instead of generic. The quality control is better. Whatever, you educate the consumer. And that's e-learning, right? That's education through, through a digital means. So I think we're going to see companies um, starting to really look at, rather than just advertising, advertising, advertising to people, trying to get people to see the value in what it is that they do by educating them. And I think we're going to see that with just-in-time delivery. And that, if you're thinking about using QR codes, you should think about linking them to not text, but what? Video and audio, right? Video especially. Um, 
and the QR code in the back of my business card, by the way, I did not have that foresight when I put it there, so it just goes to my website. But in the future, what I would do is link it to a video of myself talking to you. Right? That's the perfect thing to do on the back of a business card. Anyways, we can all have our cards reprinted now. So the, the last category of learning I want to talk about, and like I said, I was going to be brief in corporate because that's not really my field of expertise, but is this um, environment of free-range learning. And that's what I'd say would be the, it's not necessarily just informal learning. It can be formal in, in the free-range environment. Um, there are all sorts of initiatives to create groups of learners in a free, non-institution related uh, way. So um, free-range learning is just all that learning that happens outside of education and work, basically. Um, there's a couple problems with free-range learning, and again, if, if you're really interested in this idea, you should go watch my talk from last year, because we talked a lot about, you know, education moving in this direction, and what seems to be working and what doesn't. Um, but there is this big problem in free-range learning. It's called optimism bias. We tend to be very optimistic about what we think we can do, right? Probably many of you in this room have done one of the following. I won't ask you to raise your hands, because I don't want to. Um, you know, have you have to commit to this, but lynda.com is a site where you can watch videos on how to use different pieces of software. You have to pay a subscription to use it. Rosetta Stone, uh, I'm sure you've seen these in the airport, teaches you language, right? And The Great Courses is a DVD company, you know, you, you get a catalog and you order a DVD set for a course that you're going to watch, right? But what's the problem? We don't do it, right? I mean, we're, we're busy, other things push these off our plates. And so this is optimism bias. We are, we are ever optimistic about how good we're going to be about learning, right? And so all of these open education uh, movements, you know, like, like uh, I think the Gates Foundation is sponsoring NROC. I think that's right. I'm not sure I got my, my foundation right on that one, but um, it's an open repository for online courses, right? And the idea is that students who need to learn a particular first year topic in education are going to go to this online platform and it's going to provide uh, tutoring through the computer and it's going to have videos and they're going to learn all of this stuff and then they're going to go into the second year classes. What's that? That's optimism bias, right? I mean, the, real, the realistic part of this is that we don't tend to learn very well. There are a few people who do. And probably many of you in this room are part of that population because you're at a conference like this. But um, most of us need a coach. We need a human being and a group of learners who coaches us to, uh, to learn and to push ourselves and to do better and to seek out new resources. Without that coach, without that learning coach, we, we can't function in this world of just video and computer. And so, so the educator is still uh, very crucial in all of this. The, the, and I don't like to even use the word educator or instructor or professor anymore. I just like learning coach. Because that's really what we're moving towards, I think. Um, uh, another problem we have is that uh, in the free range world, we have all sorts of different resources we can learn from. You, know, you have TED Talks and Google Video and articles from the New York Times and articles from CNN, and, you know, uh, uh, audio from NPR. And there's, there's all sorts of stuff you can use to learn. There's a whole ecosystem of stuff. So how do you assess and certify learning no matter what the medium or participant or the field is? How do you find a way to bring all those things together? Because we do need to do that. We can't keep functioning in a world where learning only happens when there's been time to write a textbook, develop a course, and a degree program. Uh, the fields are moving too fast. The technology is developing too quickly. And we can't have a three to five year lag between the emergence of a field and the training for a field, because that means that the first graduate of that field would be eight years out, and what happened to the field? It's gone. It's gone. Right? So that doesn't work. We have to have a, a, a way to assess and certify right on the edge of learning. Okay. And so here's the vision for this one, and um, there's an article that was in the Futurist in January um, about this, so if you want to um, learn more about it, the easiest thing to do would be to go read the article. Um, so this is like the five-minute version of that. There's also a 20-minute version and a 45-minute version of it. Um, but the idea is that we need a, an informal uh, learning platform that can, can function on this edge. And it, it would be very simple. I mean, there's no reason why we couldn't build it today. We have all the technology to do it. It doesn't need to have AI. It doesn't need to be 
uh, super sophisticated. All it needs to do is let you, at the moment you think to yourself, oh, I want to remember that. That, that is something that's in my, my value closet for learning. It's something I want to be learning about. It's something I want to remember. That it lets you go into um, your learning platform, marks the website, or the point in the video, or the point in the audio, at which point you said, ah, this, this, this is something I need. I need to remember it. And lets you pose a question and answer about that. Because we actually do need to see things multiple times for us to remember biologically um, something. Either that or it needs to have a very strong emotional attachment. But I don't think we want to paddle prods every time we want to remember something. So um, we need to put in a question and answer, um, and maybe mark a couple of things, tag it for its content or which of our learning goals it goes to, um, and then have that question come back to us over time. Okay. So what that, what that would look like is, you know, if you have your mobile device and you're sitting between sessions, and you think, huh, I want to take five minutes and just run through a couple of my questions, um, remind myself of some things. You'd open it up, it would feed you a question, you would just think to yourself what the answer is, or you could talk it out loud or whatever you want to do. Um, then you'd say, okay, show me the answer. And you'd see the answer and you'd say, all right, I'll just rate this. One, two, or three. One, I knew it. Two, and yeah. Three, didn't know it at all. Any kind of two or three, it would send you back in. It would, it would give you the option to say, hey, do you want to go back and read that article? Do you want to go back and watch that point of the video? Do you want to go back and... Because if you don't remember it and it's something that you said you want to remember, then you should see it again. Okay? So that's very simply the idea. Um, but what, what has to happen from that is we basically have to make a new media layer on the internet. So for informal learning, we have a new media layer on the internet. So right next to your um, learn this button and your Facebook button, or, sorry, I already think it exists, right next to your Facebook button and your Twitter button and your Google Plus button now, you have a learn this button. Right? And you say, oh, this is really good. I want to remember this. You hit learn this. You're in your platform. You can write your question and answer. See other people's questions and answers. Everybody can have different questions and answers because there's different values to different people. Um, and, and that could grow very quickly. Look at how quickly like the Facebook likes showed up. Almost overnight. We went from zero, zero of these like buttons to millions of these like buttons. right? So, so we have all of the technology to do that. And the beauty of such a system would be that you could assess it. Because you could go to an expert in that field, who has you know, shown that they're an expert in the field, and you can say, I need to be assessed on this topic, this merging topic. I always use learning analytics as an example. So there's no degree programs in learning analytics. You know. So I could go to an expert in learning analytics and say, I need to be assessed to show that I'm, I've reached you know, a certain level of proficiency in this for a job or, or whatnot. Um, so I'll. Uh, give you access to my questions, it'll pull a random assortment of questions, that expert will have a face-to-face -face conversation or an online face-to-face -face conversation, they'll ask me uh, the questions, I'll, you know, we'll have a conversation about them and they'll give me a rating. It's not that different than what we do in education now. We give a multiple choice test, that's a random selection of questions about the material, right? Uh, in reality, face-to-face, real-time conversation would be better, wouldn't it, for assessing how well somebody knows something? Thinking on your feet, that whole piece we went through at the beginning. Uh, so I think we could build this very easily and it would allow us to leverage everything that's out there um, up, that's merging in real time on the internet. So um, there is a talk uh, about this. Uh, I gave a, a, in down Texas. It's about 20 minutes. If you want the long version, just go well, the medium version now. Just go watch that on this presentation. I'm going to just jump through it right now. Um, so that's, that's the, whole, uh, the whole picture, um, our three different environments, focusing a little bit more heavily on the bottom ones. And uh, I just want to kind of recap here. Um, we're heading towards a future where first, I think we're going to see that happen. The digital world is becoming so ubiquitous that it's just going to become the learning world. Right? E-learning and E is going to be a thing of the past. It's just the way we learn now. Okay? Uh, I'm not sure when that's going to happen exactly. It, it may never happen. You know, we still have the little save buttons with the floppy disk on them. Have you noticed that? <laughs> so E may never go away. But really, learning is just becoming um, digital. There's, there's, that's not going to change. So uh, the vision that I see, the positive vision I see for the future, uh, the negative vision would be rooms full of automatons with computers in front of them clicking through things, right? I don't want that vision to happen. I don't want there to not be coaches to help you learn. I don't want us to have to have this very solitary 
lonely educational experience. So I see two things that we could build um, that would get us to a better place. One is that this iLearn idea, which is a platform for the learner that they carry from one place to another with them. So they can hold everything that they've been learning there. The other platform I see is for kind of the non-formal learning, the free-range learning, which is so great. Oh, I forgot to tell you what so great stands for. SOC is social, AI is artificial intelligence, and IT is information technology. So, um, and the so great is a plan Socrates. So, oh, is that what the R is there for? Yeah, oh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the Socratic method, right? It's just kind of play on that. So I think if we have this for the informal learning, the right on the edge learning, and we have something like iLearn for the um, for the formal learning, then we could make huge strides in in how we learn digitally. Um, it would not anymore be replicating the text experience in an online environment, which is what it is now. And if you can have that long view, that text is really just a blip. It's a useful blip. It's uh, it's a blip that's not going to go away, but it's not really the way we should be focusing in on on learning. We are built for oral and video. We really are. Um, so, anyways, uh, that's it, I guess. I'm done in about three minutes for this, so we can take some questions. <laughs> yes? One of the big um, criticisms. I will repeat the question, so. Right, one of the big criticisms of. Um, of what the internet has introduced as far as learning options is the distraction. And people say that there's even an addiction to uh, distraction. And I've seen this with some, I come from an um, online learning college in Arizona, and, uh, and I've seen students um, in the learning thing, some guy brought it up yesterday, I don't remember who it was, in the learning summit. Uh, you're trying to focus on one thing and you've got an instant message pop up, or you've got email, or you've got, uh, you know, somebody have your Facebook open, how do you... Um, so I think, I think one of the things that's important that. here is that we start to recognize uh, that the comment is about distraction. You know, how do we deal with the fact that this distraction is probably um, a cause and a detriment to the learning? Um, and I think one of the ways we do it is by allowing people to customize what they see. Uh, there's this concept of like lean forward, lean back, um, where lean forward is when you're like, you're leaning forward into the computer, clicking, looking, you know, things like that. And the idea is you're very engaged, but when you are in a lean forward mode, your attention span is short. When you're watching TV or reading a book or something like that, you're in kind of a lean back mode, but your attention span is better in something like that. And so the problem that we've created with online learning, with e-learning, is that this lean forward mode we're used to uh, also means that when we read paragraphs of text in that e-learning mode, we're in a short attention span mode. So one of the things a platform could do very easily is say, oh, you're looking at text. Poof, I'll take away all the stuff around the outsides. Think about all the learning platforms now in education. They've got buttons off the side, they've got buttons across the top, right? And where do we tend to look on a, on a screen when we're, when we're surfing the web? What are the two places we look? Top and side, right? So what do we utilize that space for in education? The buttons. It's kind of dumb, isn't it? Um, you know, what, we, what should we should really do is at the moment you engage with text, that text should fill up the screen. So you no longer have all those distractions, right? I mean, that would be an ideal way to do it. But if you can customize your platform, it could, it could start to tell you things with the, with the knowledge analytics and the data, the learning analytics we're going to have, say, the rising report, say, five to, four to five years from now. Your learning platform could tell you, because it works with you all the time, mm -hmm. that, um, you know, you're not learning very well when you're engaging with text that's got all the stuff around it. But you're learning much better when you're engaging with text on a blank screen. You know, so all, all of these analytics are going to come out of these platforms, which gives us greater incentive to really customize them for the students and not the institution. It should be customized for the student. I want to collect the data based on the students. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, a, and a platform that's student-based could really do that, could collect the data based on the student. But there's no way to do it from the institution side like that. Especially when students are going from institution to institution to institution, which is going to happen more and more as they move into the digital world and the physical world. Other questions? Yes, in the back. One, um, you assume here that a lonely relationship with your uh, mentor is a, a negative one. Um, Not necessarily. So, well, that, that's what I was going to say. My, my definition of a good college education was a professor at one end of a log and you alone at the other. He's not speaking to anybody else, he's speaking to you personally. And because of that personal communication, you're listening.
listening to everything he says, and he's listening to everything you say. And in a personalized, so, so the, the question there, the comment is about, um, you know, is a, lonely, is a lonely experience a bad thing, right? Well, if we customize a learning platform for you, and you choose which content provider you're going to use, and you choose what kind of coaching experience you want to use, and you want to be the lonely student with a professor working with you one-on-one, -on -one, let's say you can pay for that option. I want, to, I want to mentor a professor. I'll pay more for it than a mentor to 30 students option, but I can have a mentor to a one to one relationship and that's it. But if you forget about the other technologies that you spoke of here, you've got that already. Except it's you know, very you're expensive. Speaking to one person that is speaking to 30 people at the same time, why do they have to know about No, okay, so, so, so here's, here's the problem with that. There's some research at the University of Michigan that's fantastic. Uh, Vilma Mesa is the researcher, and she maps classrooms. So she goes in the classroom, she maps out everywhere, everybody who's sitting in the classroom and all the engagements that happen during that time. Okay? So she marks every time the professor asks a question and every time any of the students answers it. And what you see emerge on these maps in room after room after room after room is that the professor is engaging with two to three students. Everybody else is just watching. So in that room, of, uh, that, that one to thirty experience, it's actually only an engaging experience for about and engaging in terms of like question, like a mentoring experience for two to three students, everybody else could have watched a recording of the room because they didn't interact at all during that time. So I, I think that uh, you know one of the things that's these are really disturbing. Actually, if you're an educator and you go and look at these maps and map after map after map shows you this, you start to realize that something different has to happen in a face-to-face -face environment, or it's not really much different than watching a video. I don't know if that, that helps at all, but I think if we can customize. You know, if you don't like working with other students, just turn off the interaction with them. Just say, I don't want to be available by chat or video or anything. I want to just work and that's fine. And, and there will be people who are like that. And uh, there will be people who really love using text. I think, I think reading text is just going to be a hobby. It is kind of now, isn't it? Some of us have this hobby of reading and, and some people don't. They watch the movies, which are really fantastic, right? I mean, if you've never read the book, the movie is always fantastic. Peter. Yeah. My experience in both face-to-face -face and then just the traditional Blackboard kind of environment is that there's a, a lot more individual one-on-one -on -one relationship because student work is coming in every single week from every single student. I have the same experience. You interact with four or five students and everybody else is listening. Maybe they want to, but they're really forced to interact with the, with the teacher and even in the current environment, much less these other things. So I, I think this electronic is going to give choice, but it also forces the teacher to be a much
were on like, even if you look at the text that would be behind the video, you could like, um, has anyone seen a live scribe pen? You know what these are? These digital pens. You take notes with this pen, it records the audio as you take notes. And you can double click, you can double tap on the physical page. I mean, you just, it's just a notebook, a pen and a notebook, basically. You double tap on the physical page, it brings you right to that point of the audio. That's basically what we need, right? So whether you're scanning the text on that end or watching a video on the other end, um, when you mark it, it marks both places. It knows the video and audio are linked, and it, it, you know that, that brings you into both places. Alex and I had a lot of conversations about learning this button, so he's over here designing it, I think. <laughs> All right, well then, um, I'll see you around the conference. Hope you enjoyed it.